So friends, welcome back. Thanks so much for joining us again. Our next guest really, really, really needs no introduction. I think if you're a Catholic in the English speaking world, you know who this guy <laughs> is. But Chris Stefanik, he is one of those those powerhouse laymen in the church who has uh, the Lord lit a fire in his heart years ago, and it has just been burning like an inferno ever since. Chris is, uh, he has reached so many people. His live talks reach 85,000 people a year plus between his his online reality series and everything else he does with video and radio. He reaches millions and millions of people. He authored a confirmation program chosen that has already formed 600,000 teens. And way more important than that, he's a dad, he's a father, and he's a grandparent, and he is living that vocation <laughs> as a, a sign to the world of God's goodness. Chris, thanks so much for being here with us. Hey, good to be with you, man. That was my head is so big after the introduction. <laughs> man, I can't even I can't even fit it into my, my part of the screen here. Just, you know, you know. Sorry, yeah, we'll have to work on on getting a bigger screen for you know if we get to interview you again, we'll have it way bigger. <laughs> well, Chris, it I might get a little bit. Man. It might get a little bit bigger. So, uh, Chris, I want to start by really thanking you for making time for us. And I got to share a little story. You inspired me many years ago. It was about 10 years ago. I was kind of discerning my future and I was at a focus conference and you were speaking. And I didn't Thank know you. people like you existed. And I thought, what, God, what do you want me to do? And I saw this guy doing full time evangelization at a diocese, raising a beautiful family. I said, that could be what my life could be like. I didn't know. Mm. Chris, that's literally what I'm doing today. I work full time in diocesan oh, evangelization. I got four little boys. I mean, you showed me what was possible. So I really praise just God. I'm so I'm so grateful I get the chance to tell you. Thank you. Um, Bro, thanks so for that sharing that, man. That means that really means a lot. Uh, praise God. To to um, you know to be a lay evangelist is a, is a unique thing in the history of the church. You know, there's there's uh, there's lay there's there's priests, there's religious, and then you have theologians uh, who are teaching somewhere in academia. But a lay evangelist, like, what is that? And um, you know, I <laughs> strange thing is like I, I didn't know this was really possible either. Uh, but there's, and I, and I think I spent a lot of years in my life trying to fit molds of what I thought other people were doing and thought maybe I could do what that person is, is and maybe I could be what that person is. And, and when, you know, when I was a little kid, my, my parents asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I, I looked at them all confused and I said, I want to be a big one, Christopher. Like, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> I want to be myself, but larger. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, it, it's taken a lot of years in adulthood to realize that within the church and within whatever God's calling us to do, we don't discover it unless we just break all those molds and, and just say, well, okay, I, I, I honestly, I don't even know what this is supposed to be. I don't even know what you call this or how to do it. Or some people ask, ask me, like, how do I do what you do? It's like, I don't know how I'm doing what I do. <laughs> There's no job description. There's no like, hey, we're hiring Catholic lay evangelists here. That's a rarity. Like, so it's, anyway, thanks for sharing that, man. I, I, we'll, let's continue to just follow him wherever he forms a new path for us. Amen, man. Amen. I'm sorry. You see, I just I just told you guys I only had about a half hour. And here I cut you off in the middle of the intro for five minutes. No, Where, wherever no, it needs to go. But yeah, yeah I, I mean I really I really relate to that. Sometimes you can't find your place, but you know you have this calling in the church. I think of um soundtrack or musicians, they say, you know, inspired by this artist, this artist, this artist. That's kind of how I view my life at this point is I've yeah. taken a little bit from different people to just be who God wants me to be. So Yeah, man. Yeah, praise God for that. Keep well, leading, um, Lord. Yes. Amen. Well, if you don't mind, would you mind just sharing, you know, um, your journey with the Lord and how you became who you are today? You know, Christophanic yeah. lay evangelist. Uh, so in uh, junior high, I was partying and drinking after school regularly and wanted to be like my secular rock stars. That's who I wanted to be. Uh, not what I'm doing now. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I have a distinct memory of hanging out at a friend's house, having a crayon in one hand and a shot of Jack Daniels in the other. So that's, that's the headspace I was in. A little confused. And my parents dragged me to a retreat that I did not want to go on. And it's, it, it was the joy in the room that I saw as soon as I walked in there that changed my life. I remember a guy who was probably 60 years old, just praising God with his hands up in the air. And <laughs> it wrecked me. You know, I, the first Christians call themselves the living ones. And, and when I saw them, I realized I was dead. Oh, and I wanted what they had. And that changed all the priorities and dreams in my life. And, and all I wanted to do the rest of my life, and I had no idea what this would be or look like, 
is to to share what I had found on that on that retreat. I, I've I've not had other jobs. I've not had a, a secular career. This is it, man. Um, so, what forms has that taken over the years, and how how has it gotten me where I am? Uh, this is where it's it's um you know when people say I want to I want to be like a you know a lay evangelist like I don't I don't know how to get there. Uh, I know people like Jason Everett who went straight from college to being hired by Catholic Answers to doing chastity talks for 20 years. Um, for me, it, it took the form of, you know, I had no idea what God wanted. I, I volunteered in youth ministry and, and when I was in Steubenville thinking I'll do anything but that, but I'll try it out. And then you discover where your gifts and, and needs of the world intersect is where God's calling you. So I was great at that and lean into it. Parish youth ministry starting in the East LA area for four and a half years, diocesan ministry for nine years for two different dioceses, working for La Crosse, Wisconsin and Denver. But then the call crystallized more and more over the years <clears throat> to really do evangelization, to stick to that charismatic message, that core message of the gospel, which I think much of the world has forgotten, doesn't associate with the Catholic Church, for sure. And a lot of Catholics, I still run up against this. They're, they're sometimes priests or like, you sound like a Protestant. So, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, I think you're missing something here, buddy. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I mean, we we uh, the, the the core message of the gospel is it's the it's the the message that makes the rest of Catholicism make sense. And if 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 our message is falling on deaf ears, it's because we don't have a context to put it in. We have disjointed doctrines that don't fit into a larger story or context. The context is what I discovered as a kid that Jesus came to give his life to the full, that he created us because he loves us, that he died for us. That we're, we're to fall in love with him. That we're entering his love story of God. That the culmination of which is 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 what he calls a wedding banquet in Revelation. You know, so this is this is what it's about. And outside that context, it's all empty. And that's that's what the fire that's grown in my heart over the years. That's become irresistible and has consumed all of the other work I, I do. Is to keep telling people that. In, in many di in different ways. <laughs> Amen, man. Let's make the Lord Jesus known and what He did for us. That's I'm right, pumped man. up. I like. I want to. I want to go to work now and make this stuff happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, buddy. Um, so I, I work for the church too, and uh, it, it's really. I mean, similar to Justin, um, the trajectory of my life changed because of, of guys like you who are, who are just a little bit uh, before us and, and said yes to the Lord. Um, it's interesting you 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 brought up the living ones because you've got a new book called Living Joy. And I wanted to talk about so, that sorry, a little so, bit. So I've inspired both of you to lay evangelization. I'm so sorry to your wives and to your kids. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. It's a combo effort. I there's can't. there's sacrifices. <laughs> well, you I can't I, take we can also, responsibility for these guys. Yeah, we can lay some of the blame at the feet of our mutual friends rolling into the net. So they they can't escape that either. Um, so uh, so you you released a, a, a new book towards the end of 2020, Living Joy, Nine Rules to Help You Rediscover and Live Joy Every Day. And I don't think there's a person out there who doesn't recognize like joy is important. And like you said, when you were a young kid and you saw that, you were like, I need that. I, ha I, I need to have that. Even if we're not real articulate about how that's different than happiness or contentment. Um, yeah. But why, why that book and why at the end of 2020? Yeah. Uh, I, you know, this has been my... It, it was the thing that converted me is seeing the joy of Christians. Uh, it's, it's, um, you know, if, if I'm to step outside myself and examine myself and what makes me effective, which is a dangerous thing to do, honestly. Uh, but it's also necessary a little bit to know what, what God's anointed you with and to lean into that, to try to be intentional about owning it. It's dangerous because it could lead to pride or careerism or, uh, hey, let me objectify and then package and try to deliver that which is me. Uh, I should, you know, get a tattoo of a barcode on my, on myself. Like, you know, like, that's stupid. That's, that, that, it could be a toxic <laughs> way to think. But it's like, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm going on a tangent here. These, all these things are necessary in, in ministry in 2021. Like, what's my brand? What's my logo? Oh man, the apostle didn't have to worry about this crap, <laughs> but here we are. Um, <laughs> endless hours is the thing about these things. So, uh, <laughs> but, but if I was to say there is a charism I have to lean into, it's that, it's that joy is attractive. And that's what converted me and captured my heart. And it's the joy that flows from the message of the gospel. I mean, when you uh, are in love, the fruit of that is joy. And when you're caught up into the love story of the gospel, the fruit of that should be joy in the life of a Christian, which is not just a passing feeling, but something that runs deeper. Uh, yeah. It's, it's uh, you know, the, there might be a lot of chop on the surface of the ocean, but underneath it's not moving. 
you know, you could be at a funeral and it could be the genuine motion of sadness. But underneath that, for Christian, at the front row of a funeral, there's hope and there's joy concurrent yeah. with total grief. Mm -hmm. um, but this is this is what makes Christians attractive. And this is something I felt like the Lord calling me to be intentional about. That's for many per periods of my life has come naturally, but in 2020 did not. And force me to reflect on, okay, what do I do to, I mean, I'm a leaky tire like anybody else, right? How do I stay filled with the joy of the Lord? And I, and I, and I felt like I have to get really intentional about this. So I, I wrote a book about nine rules for living, living that joy of the Lord and, and staying in it. So we could be uh, not, not just so we can enjoy life more, which is one of the fruits of this, but is, is also so we can share the gospel effectively, not, not just in what we do, but in who we are. Cause if we, if we're not exuding some sort of joy, I don't know why anybody would want to bother with what we're selling. Yeah, yeah. I think um, you've got a, a pretty good uh, friend who says the same thing in the joy of the gospel. I mean, if Christians are, if we're, if we're unhappy, then people are going to say like, they're, whatever they're selling, I'm not interested. So Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We, we, that, that is, that, that's God's calling card is our joy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, that's a big deal. Uh, and, and we sometimes look at our situation in life and think, you know, I'll be joyful when I fix this. And the Lord is saying, no, no, you have to be joyful in order to fix this. Yeah. Yeah. You or know, even if, getting, if we don't we get the order all wrong. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that, that's a good one. Um, so the, I'd say the two rules that are hardest for me to live by are love myself and rest. Uh, I'm pretty hard on myself and it, it's hard to slow down. Um, so even like, Sundays, the Sabbath, it's really hard for me to, to rest and just step back from the things I want to do. Uh, yeah. any, anything you've learned over the years to make it easier to live by those rules? Yeah, I'm going to grab I'm going to grab this book. Um, sure. it's, it's, love, love yourself is, is rule number two, because if you don't, don't do that, man, you're destroying any possibility of joy. Yeah, yeah. And rest is, I believe, rule seven, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should I should just know this. Yeah, the rest is yeah. Um, yeah. It, 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 really, we ha we have to. This is sorry. I'm going to jump back for one sec. This is again. This is urgent to to follow these rules, no matter what's going on in your life. It's urgent to lean into the joy of the Lord. Uh, when, when the people of God were going to go rebuild their fallen city, in and uh, they were in exile and they were comfortable to rebuild a fallen city in the ancient world might mean that you're going to get killed because you have no protective walls. Yeah. Nehemiah said the joy of the Lord must be your strength. So joy is not what you get when the battle is won. It's what you need to enter the battle. But there's certain uh, interior battles you have to take on, which is where these nine rules came from, uh, from Scripture, too. Uh, there's certain interior battles you have to take on to, to be winning that war for joy within yourself so you can enter all the external battles in your life yeah. with the right spirit so you can rebuild these walls. And, man, if we ever need to rebuild the church and the world and our personal lives and our businesses, right now is the time. Well, it's impossible, Chris. Everything's in, in ruins. Yes, but no, no, no. You have to be joyful to enter the battle and to enter the ruins, <laughs> whether it's your, your marriage or whatever the heck it is. But, um, but love yourself. I actually wrote a whole other book on this one called I Am and a, and a video program. So it's on reallifecatholic.com. I think more people struggle with this than any other, other rule. You know, uh, we, we find that which we hate in ourselves and we latch onto it. Yeah, or yeah. or we live out of wounds and failures and think that that's what makes up who I am. And is it any wonder that so many Christians look joyless or look like they're beat down? It's because they're beating themselves up on the inside. And and usually we don't even know we're doing this. We think without thinking about what we're thinking, but we have this general uh, weakness in the gut as we go through life, and and we don't really contemplate where that is coming from. And it's from our self talk, you know, do, how do you label yourself? How do you talk to yourself? Do you label yourself in light of a sin you committed, in light of an imperfection, in light of, um, or, or do you think you get your value or worth or dignity from some accomplishment that you reach because you're living out of a gaping wound because people didn't tell you you were precious and valuable just because of who you are? I try to tell my kids I'm, I'm proud of them when they've done nothing. Why? Well, because you're mine. That's why. You know, that, like that's that what lot. we have to, right? That's what we have to start believing about our, ourselves, that we're precious, we're valuable because we're his. And the word of God tells us who we are. It's not your worst sin. And it's not your failure. It's not the thing you struggle with, which is not, you, does not define you. I have a kid who has ADD. I'm like, you know, that's, this is something you're struggling with. This is not you. And if yeah. you need a lot of um, guidance, a lot of correction, don't start labeling yourself as 
you know, I'm less than the other kids. You know, a, a, a mule doesn't need a lot of formation, but a stallion does. There's incredible potential. Yeah, yeah. In, in that kid who's got ADD, you know. So, uh, but it, 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 all these things, how our life pans out is shaped by how we talk to ourselves. And if you're not listening to the word of God and what he says about you, well, doesn't God tell me that I'm nothing and I'm dirt? And some of the saints said that. No, no God tells you you're actually worth dying for. I mean, we do say every mass, I'm not worthy that you should under my roof. What happens within two minutes? God of the universe is on my tongue. Yeah. He does enter I mean, into your room. <laughs> yeah, he does. He enters in. And not, you know, not because you have it all together, but because you're his and you're precious to him. And that's how you have to start talking to yourself. So but there's a lot of work to be done in this area. So the, the, this book will help. My I Am book will help even more if, if that's something you want to lean into more specifically. And the I Am program, which um, has changed people's lives. I know the folks at uh, in Celebration, you mentioned Annette, they use it uh, with their youth group. It's actually it's yeah. for all, all ages, obviously. This one. Yeah, yeah. So that's um, Living Joy, the nine rules for, for to help you rediscover and live joy every day. And then yeah. I Am. Gotcha. Um, yep, yep. Uh, but this awesome. is stuff I've had to be intentional about myself. I mean, this this yeah. this all comes from my experience, from my wounds, from my leaning into these things. Uh, and then rest, man, that's a huge one. We're horrible at that, mm -hmm. especially if you're in ministry. Yeah, it's always more to do. Yeah, it's but, a job that never ends. Yeah, right. Um, and and if we're not careful, our sense of worth comes from it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's that's when it becomes toxic. That's when that's when the ministry becomes about us. Mm -hmm. and it turns on itself and it can become an unhealthy thing. Uh, but, you know, of the Lord's Ten Commandments, you can give many. One is all about not working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't do anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, except worship, you know, but then rest and hang out. And yeah. uh, you, you'd think, I, I'll bet you when God told Moses that one, you know, he was thinking, like, wait, what, really? <laughs> like, this one should be the easiest. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> especially in America, American culture battles that. Oh most. man, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It's 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 incredible how hard this is, and and we we give in to every distraction comes in our phones, and and just we constantly are scrolling on our day off, and there's something called attention residue. When you're distracted, it takes about 20 minutes for your brain to get back on the track it was on before. Uh, so you think, what's the harm of every 20 minutes just checking my text or my email or anything work-related or, or you know, making sure I'm responding to people's needs at work? It's every 20 minutes. It means, well, that, that means that you're never actually fully focused on your wife and kids, ever, mm -hmm. or on mm -hmm. resting or recuperating or anything like that at all, ever. So what's the cost? It's a, it's a subtle, uh, a subtle the, 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 the devil's a thief and a robber. Yeah. He comes to steal and destroy. He robs the life that God has created you for. He robs you of your vocation, of your relationships, uh, because you're not obeying his command to rest. To, and, and to push out of your consciousness, out of your mind, oh, I could do this thing, I could do that thing. Uh, just to really just shut up and, and chill out a little bit. And that's radical. Mm -hmm. that, that puts us in a proper place in, in the created order of things. When we don't rest, we become a cog in, in the wheel. And we forget that, that society and the structures that we have in society and I mean, even even the, the the things that God has given us for rituals in, in the church, all these things he's given to serve us so that we could serve him, but but not so that we could become a, a part of a machine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when we don't rest, we forget that. And then we uh, people in ministry, man, I, I don't know how many how much your audience is folks in, in ministry work, but I'll tell you, man, it's uh, then you start to become someone you'd never tell the kids in, in your youth group or people going through RCA under you to become, you know, right. Yeah. Work yourself down yeah. to nothing. Right. And then <laughs> lose joy. And then, it, you know, then it's like, well, yeah. we, I think we all know those, those people who are in the church and they love the church, Yeah, but they just, they don't, they're so tired and worn out that they're no longer good witnesses to the love of God. And some days that's me yeah. and you, right? Yeah, right. for sure. Yeah. No, and not, not yeah. definitely not pointing fingers. Like, you know, yeah, to my no, family. I'm, yeah, and 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 uh, whenever I'm losing a joy, I really I got to come back to which, you know, frankly, this again, the book I wrote came out of my own experience here. Um, it came out of a lot of research too, but you know, I have to look back and do a gut check on what which which one of these things am I not doing anymore? 
Because mm-hmm. it's I can always point it back to one of these things. Either I'm hating on myself uh, internally, or, or or get my worth in the wrong place, or I'm uh, I'm not resting, I'm not giving thanks enough. There's there's all sorts of things. There's are simple. I mean, God's God did not have a mission to complicate our lives. We complicate our lives. We're really good at complicating things. I think God is too simple for us to understand. Yeah, and I love the origin of the Sabbath because it was about freedom from work, telling the Jewish people, you're free from work on the seventh day, and Pharaoh wanted to make them work on the Sabbath. But it was to show us our freedom, actually, that, no, I I don't need to be on the treadmill or the hamster wheel all the time because my God loves me. He's going to take care of things. I I belong to him. It was a, it caused a, it caused war. <laughs> it's I mean, just about resting, just about not working. Yeah, yeah. That that's what made Pharaoh. Uh, you know, he felt like his whole who he was, his his uh, his lordship over them was challenged by them not working. It was God's command to go and have a festival in the desert and to worship Him. Uh, and, and Pharaoh did not like that. Obviously, because well, you know, you exist for me. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And huh. you know, we don't exist for our work. We yeah. just for God. So it's like I'm a little a little tyrant Pharaoh over my own life. Mm-hmm. And won't, like... well said, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's really well said. Thanks. Well, you've got it's not. I mean, you you do more than just books, and so we wanted to ask you, uh, as, as time permits, about real life Catholic, and then about mm-hmm. your new initiative on Saint Joseph. Yeah, we're uh, so real life Catholic. It's it's, uh, it's about proclaiming that core message of the gospel and making it easy for other people to do so and it, you know we have things like the uh, i am program and my joy of the world book or uh saint joseph program which is coming out on father's day uh but it, it's it all it all ties back to uh living out that basic gospel message in everyday life in everyday ways that make life better <laughs> We're, we have this crazy idea that life is better with jesus than without yeah <laughs> but life is better when you're living in a relationship with god you know, mm-hmm. if, we, if we're not communicating that, what are we doing? How are yeah, we right, right. How are we sharing the faith? You know, um, so the the main way that we we we've, we've done that is through our live events where we coach up parishes for six months before I get there and empower them to invite everybody back to church. So we'll see one to two thousand people at small parishes come, mm-hmm. uh, and half the people don't usually go to church. Mm-hmm. So most of them would say, "Yeah, I'm Catholic," but they're they're maybe keepers, right? Christmas Eve are Catholics. Uh, but these are the people we're trying to really mobilize parishes to invite back. And we see genuine conversions happen as we call people to that relationship with the Lord that maybe they haven't heard it this way. Uh, and then and then we empower them to go out and, and engage our, you know, one of the reasons we have these programs is to, to help them engage that relationship with Jesus in their everyday life in everyday ways that aren't just educational. Uh, not that that's a bad thing, but mm-hmm. I think a disproportionate amount of Catholic ministries provide resources that are primarily about intellectual formation, which, which yeah. again, I'm not putting that down. I'm not anti-intellectual. It's, it's not, it's a necessary part of falling in love with yeah, the Lord. Yeah. But it's uh, only a part. It's, it's not all of it. That's right. It's only a part and not everybody's even called to go deeper in that way. We, we've mistaken holiness for mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. The devil knows more theology than all three of us <laughs> easily. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, and then empowering folks to start small group ministries using our resources. But then I, I gotta be honest. I don't care if they forget about our resources or the fact that we visited their parish. What I care about is that they encounter the Lord and that they keep meeting in small groups and sharing faith together. Because if those things happen, if there's that one two punch, of the the proclamation of the gospel and people gathering together as friends and sharing faith, I'm convinced the world will change. It's not too late. We have yeah. not lost. We've actually not lost Western civilization yet. The devil wants you to throw the towel in prematurely. And uh, I, I think we can we can push back and win if we respond to the grace of, of, the, of being simple and like the first Christians were again. Amen, man. I love that. I, I think that's the that's the model for uh, for I think that's the model the Lord wants to use to rebuild the church throughout the world is uh, like asking people to start living it in their homes again. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I, I'm, I'm, that's uh, that's what's working for the evangelical churches that are destroying us numbers wise. I, I yeah, don't want to say yeah. it like they're enemies, but uh, no. but you know, the Saddleback Church they went from six thousand small groups to nine thousand during COVID. They grew by a third. Wow! Wow! And most and a yeah. quarter of the people in their small groups are not yet in their in their church. So it ends up being a front porch to draw people back into their church. Uh, yeah. 
in the Catholic context, when we do small groups, it's usually uh, very top down. It's very hierarchical where there's a formator who's been formed very well. And, and, uh, but really what ends up being is a catechetical experience, which is, yeah. again, it's good. It serves its own purpose. Uh, but what's ca- caught on like a brush fire in the non-denominational evangelical world is that people simply meet as friends, as equals. And that that's a common thing that if you're in this church, you're meeting people with intentional spiritual friendships getting together such that and it's not not this big uh, mandate to double in size or split your group every year or two. No, it's just that the front porch is there, that if you meet someone who's interested, you're not saying, hey, come to mass with me, which was never meant for evangelization 101. You're saying, come right. over for a beer. I have once a month, five friends who get together and, and brothers and we share our faith. And that's your intro to Christianity. And it's and it's working. Sadly, it's not working in Catholics among yeah. Catholics yet. But it's simple, and it can. It can. Yeah. We we can have six to nine thousand small groups in a parish, uh, which would result in what Saddleback has seen: is fifty thousand baptisms as they open their doors. It, it, uh, it would be a mess at Easter Vigil, an absolute parking nightmare. Yeah, if we emulated this model. <laughs> oh man, we'd need stadiums, and I'd be okay with that. Yeah, it would. The right of election would overwhelm the cathedral. Uh, and, yeah. and so it's, this is this is replicable. And it, and it, when we can do this, uh, if there's a blessing for our ministry during COVID, it's that it's forced us to look at creating resources and a focus and training around that so that when we go back to events, which will be starting in early 2022, we're going to leave people. If there's a thousand people there, I'm going to say, I want to leave you with 300 small groups. And we're going to equip you to do it for the next year. Awesome. Go. It's going to be awesome i i uh yeah i'm I'm really excited what lies ahead that sounds great man well i I cannot wait for you to to go out i hope you're able to come to to my diocese and justin's diocese what's your diocese dan orlando oh yeah i'll be both here together yeah absolutely actually you know what the cover of this book that's a picture taken of me in celebration florida Oh, sweet. And how can and how can you not smile big in a place like I know, <laughs> yeah. It's built okay. built by Disney. Yeah. Right. The happiest place on earth. Actually the happiest <laughs> place on earth is, is Haiti. And I wrote about that. In the yeah. Book. yeah. People wow. smile bigger sure. at, at Haiti than Disney. There's no question. Yeah. yeah it's a hard place. It's not easy. But there's no. a, there's joy. There's a joy there that's living yeah. away. Yeah. Well, Chris. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we're really grateful for just you taking the opportunity this morning to, to be with us and share about really what the Lord has, has asked you to do for him. And I know you're not just an inspiration to, to Justin and me, but to lots of other folks out there who heard you at conferences and, and talks and videos and whatnot and said, um, I want to say yes to Jesus like that guy. So thank you so much for always pointing Praise us back God. to the Lord. Thanks, man. Amen, thank you so man. much. And, and uh, everybody's listening. I just sign up for our newsletter in reallifecatholic.com. That's how you get all the free stuff. All the inspirational videos we pump out, updates on what we're doing. Their St. Joseph program, which I really am excited about. It's not like a lot of our other programs, which is a little more to the unreached and small groups. Uh, but I had to do this because it's the year of St. Joseph. So there's a lot in there um, that's that's uh, a mix of theological reflection and and stuff born from contemplation. We have Scott Hahn, Father Don Calloway in it with us, and uh, Sister Josephine, and uh, it's Jason Everett. So it's a great mix of folks. Uh, but then uh, the stuff I, I do in the program is, is against more uh, my charism of really playing into your everyday life and finding the meaning and joy in a quiet stuff, which mm-hmm. is where Jesus spent most of his life and Joseph spent all of his. Um, so that if, if that's that's a great way I feel called by God to lean into this year of St. Joseph, to imitate him in that way. Um, but yeah, bro, thank you for having me on. And, and uh, I, I'm inspired by the fact that the Lord used me to inspire you and you inspire me. And we're all just, sorry, I just said inspired three times in one sentence. There we go. That's okay. We're all just so inspired. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> add, add a fourth. Well, Chris, would you mind closing us in prayer? Yeah, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for creating us for yourself. Thank you for creating us with a dream for us to give us the joy that we long for. We ask you to help us to, to follow your plan for our lives. To, um, to lean into wherever you call us to derive all our sense of self and worth and, and uh, meaningfulness solely from our relationship with you, Lord, which makes all of life beautiful. Help us to be faithful to what you place before us this day. 
May your joy be our strength. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, brothers. Hey, thank, thank you. you. God bless you, man. Hopefully we meet in person sometime. Oh, we sure will. Keep it up. All righty. Peace, brother. Thank you. Peace.